Today on the Treatment Free Beekeeping Podcast, Kirk Webster. Kirk Webster, it is great to have you on the phone today. Um, you are one of my heroes from for the past couple of years since I discovered your work on your website at kirkwebster.com. Um, you don't have the same um, internet presence that, that a lot of beekeepers do these days, and so... Um, I have I have really wanted to talk to you for a long time, but haven't gotten a hold of you until now. Yeah, well, I'm glad it worked out. Uh, I hope I don't disillusion you too bad. <laughs> I don't think that's possible. Anyway, um, let's you you've uh, according to your website, you've published a new article this just January um, that that talks about your recent. Um, the things that you've done recently, but let's start with uh, how you got into beekeeping and um, some of your philosophies and, and things like that. Well, um, I first got interested in bees. I was in high school. It was actually a kind of an accident. Um, I finished high school at a, a real small school in, in central Vermont called the Mountain School. It was pretty isolated place on a little farm. I, I loved it there. It was, there was lots of wilderness around and, you know, spent a lot of time outdoors uh, skiing and skating, whatever, in the wintertime. And I, I hurt my knee in a pretty bad toboggan crash uh, the year I was a junior in high school and, um, you know, couldn't ski or go outside, do the things I usually did. And this just, I was just moping around, I guess, and somebody, I can't even remember who it was, felt sorry for me and gave me this little book about honeybees, um, thought I might be interested, and I just started reading it, and I, you know, I just said, gee, this is, <laughs> this is really interesting. So then that spring, um, I was back visiting my folks in New Jersey, and I tried to find somebody who kept bees right around there. You know, this was in the, you know, pretty much right in the suburbs of northern New Jersey, but I found a man named Myron Sermak, who uh, was a Ukrainian immigrant who lived just a couple miles, you know, from my house where I grew up, and uh, he um, he had about thirty colonies of bees there. Uh, he was, you know, getting elderly at that time. He first came to this country in 1914, even before the you know the Russian Revolution or World War One. And um, he, he struggled like many immigrants do for a while, but he eventually made quite a good success uh, starting a, a Ukrainian book and music store for the Ukrainian community in New York City. And uh, that was, you know, became quite a, a good business and enabled him to buy this nice house in the suburbs in Saddle River, New Jersey. And, um, you know, the his little compound there, I don't know if it was an acre or something like that, it was surrounded by trees. You couldn't see anything from the road. You'd come up his driveway and then come around the corner and his uh, um, his hedgerows there. And he, he and his wife had converted the rest of the property into a almost a recreation of a Ukrainian village, such like he grew up in, uh, just full of flowers and gardens. Um Lots of birdhouses on tall poles, and he even had some some beehives in the traditional style, which from his part of the Ukraine, they were made out of straw, not not like skeps. They had frames uh, like our beehives do, but the uh, the walls were made of a thatch of straw and with a thatch roof, and um, there was still one colony functioning like that when I when I got there. Um, his his wife had died just. To, year or two earlier and so he wasn't able to keep up with everything the way she did but um at least there, there were still bees flying out of one of those hives and then he had his 30 colonies in modern you know langstroth equipment in the back of the property um, 
which is where we work most of the time. But anyway, so he was a wonderful man, a wonderful mentor who got me started, just, just showed me how to use the tools and the basics of beekeeping and also um, uh, it also encouraged me after a while to, uh, you know, to pursue beekeeping as a career. Um, he was the first one who thought of it. It definitely wasn't my idea <laughs> at first, but um, anyhow, as you know, the Ukraine beekeeping is very important there. And, mm-hmm. um, I would listen, you know, we my normal pattern with him was I'd, I'd go over to help him whenever I was visiting my folks, and, you know, I'd show up around nine, and we'd go out and work in the bee yard, or maybe we'd work in the garden, or or whatever until noon, and then he'd say, oh, time for lunch. And so we marched back to the house, and he says to me, you know, I'm the 17-year-old kid. He says, you sit down and rest. I'll uh, fix lunch for us. <laughs> this is what he would, he would fix lunch, which is usually some boiled eggs and vegetables from his garden. And then I'd have to sit there for another couple of hours, listen to him reminisce about Ukraine. And, uh, you know, that was from before... Um, electricity and you know living in the houses with candles as the only light and these big earthen stoves they used to heat the house and even sleep on at night everything was by ox cart and wagon you know so of course my eyes were just bugging out of my head the whole time <laughs> you know, I was totally fascinated by him and his whole his whole story so and this was in the 60s yeah, let's, that, that would have been, let's see, that would have been 1970, 70, okay. 71, yeah. Yeah, you're about two years younger than my dad, so I can kind of frame the, the timeline by thinking about his age. Yeah, yeah, I'm 61 this year, so. Well, that sounds that sounds great. I mean, I, I love to, to sit down and talk to to people who have stories to tell like that. I mean, I have a podcast, so I, you know, listen to people's stories. Um, so from there, you're a teenager learning from an old Ukrainian guy. Where do you, how do you, where does it progress from there? Well, he was the one, he, he had heard of, Myron had heard of Charlie Mraz, um, you know, who lives here in Middlebury, Vermont, where I, where I live now. Um, and uh, he advised me to see if I could go and work for him. And Charlie, you've, you know, I'm, he's probably come up somewhere in your, <laughs> at least somewhere in your, um, you know, pursuit of talking with beekeepers. But he, Charlie was the son of Czech immigrants uh, who were living on Long Island. And he got interested in bees when he was very young and um first had some bees there on Long Island, and then as soon as he was old enough to have a motorcycle, um, earned enough money to buy himself his, his first motorcycle and rode it out to the Finger Lakes region in western New York State, which was a famous buckwheat honey producing area at that time. And that, you know, that would be somewhere in the range of, you know, 25, 1925, um, somewhere in there, and he worked there for a couple years. Um, he worked for, among other people, a man named Stevens, and his honey house still exists. It's uh, uh, John Ryan, I believe, is, owns the honey house now. <laughs> There's a beekeeping business still there in the same area, but the buckwheat is gone now. It's all completely different, and, uh, and Charlie just, he worked there for a few years, and then he had a chance to work for J.E. Crane uh, here in Middlebury, Vermont, and J.E. Crane was a very well-known beekeeper at that time, wrote a column for the old, you know, Gleanings and Bee Culture magazine, and in fact, so Charlie came, I believe, to Middlebury in 1927, and he was, of course, a young man starting out, and J.E. Crane was quite elderly and just ending his long career in beekeeping, which of course at that time went back to before the time of movable frame hives and, you know, back to the Civil War era. So, you know, it was it was it was towards the end of Charlie's life I tried to get him to talk more about his association with J. E. Crane and the you know, and the history there. It's just very it's very fascinating. Um, and this this area of the Champlain Valley 
has been known for honey and bees, uh, as far as I can tell, almost you know since the beginning of of the settlement here, and and certainly since uh, you know even before the modern equipment was was widely used. So that was that was my you know my Berlitz education in commercial beekeeping was working for Charlie in 1973 um, here here in Middlebury, and then you know I've been um, oh I you know I I spent years away in, in other places. I went to college on the West Coast for a while, um, where in Western Washington, where conditions weren't so good for bees. I helped my my um, uh, cousins with their little farm down in Maryland, and then I actually went back to the mountain school where I finished high school and took care of their farm program for three seasons there before I, um, you know, started the apiary that I have now. So when you when did you start the apiary that you have now? Well, um, when I was going to college in... Um, the Evergreen State College in Western Washington, and I hadn't. I lived there for three years without even coming back to the East Coast, and I just decided um, all at once that I was I was going to come back to the Northeast, and um, I I came back, and I I hadn't really had much connection with bees, and during the three years I spent in Washington, the that wet part of the state where I was was not especially good for beekeeping. I did see a few beehives there, but hadn't really thought about it so much. But then I came back to, uh, ended up in uh, Concord, Massachusetts, where a good friend of mine lived, and um, his his family home was now you know pretty much emptied of all the children. They had lots of room there, and his his family offered you know to let me rent part of the house, and and so that's where I sort of started off again in the Northeast. And just just sort of by chance, I, I was visiting a farm there that, that my dad, my dad was a newspaper reporter, and he had written a story about this place, the Hutchins Farm in Concord, Massachusetts. And I just went over there to meet the owners and, and look at the farm, and they were very, you know, generously taking them some kid around the farm when I noticed some bees flying in and out of some bushes, and I said, oh, what, what's going on in there? He says, oh, there's some beehives back in there, but we don't have time to take care of them. It's probably just a horrible mess. He says, if you want to take care of them, you can have them, you know, as long as you leave them here so they'll pollinate our, our crops. And So I literally had to cut the bushes away with clippers to get back to the hives, and, you know, they had been there for some years without any care or whatever, and the equipment, a lot of it was homemade with unplaned boards and stuff that they had done, but I was, that just sort of rekindled the whole thing for me, and uh, I um, I took those four, those four hives and, and split them all and got, made some new colonies, and I bought some new equipment, and, and I started looking on the, you know, the, the the want ads, you know, since before the internet, um, and found a few more colonies for sale and bought those and started splitting them. And, you know, meanwhile, I had, I had been assuming that I would try to find another job like the one I had at the mountain school or taking care of a farm for a, a school or an institution or something like that. And, you know, I was sort of using Concord as a base for, for that kind of search. I'd visit other you know, schools and programs that had that had a some kind of a farm like that all around New England. Um, but then I just I just gradually started building up this apiary, and and over a few years I just I realized I'd rather I'd rather work on building the apiary up to have as my own business rather than you know go back to working for another institution or whatever. And so that's how just gradually over a few years. Um, you know, became a more serious thing while I was living there in Concord. And then I had sort of outgrown the facilities there, and it was, you know, it was a very expensive area. There was no way, you know, I could ever buy property there or, or anything like that. So I started looking for another place to move the apiary, and I was kind of surprised, you know, some people that I knew up in this area, you know, where I had lived before, encouraged me to move up to move back up here. I never really had thought of it myself. It, it's already quite crowded with bees, 
uh, here in the Champlain Valley, but, you know, they kind of, uh, you know, convinced me that there was still room for one more, and and so I eventually, uh, I'd have to look in my my records there exactly what year it was. I, ah, it was, you know, just right around the time, I think it was 85, 84, 85, when the uh, Chernobyl power plant exploded, I, I remembered that event occurred during the first year I was back up here. Um, so that's when I moved. I, I had just about a hundred colonies at that point. I moved it back up here and, you know, both down there in Massachusetts and in Vermont when I first came. And for several years, I, I worked in construction mainly, um, you know, mostly during the fall and winter and then, um, worked on the APR in the spring and summer. That's how I, that's how I built it up um, until I was, you know, just barely able to, um, you know, have enough income from the APRA to support me full time, and just continued on from there. So not long after that, the varroa mite showed up, and well, I guess about that time, the the tracheal mite was a big problem as well. Can you tell us about your experience with that? Yeah, the tracheal mite. We we had the the two mites, um, you know one after the other they you know the and that was actually a very serendipitous thing for my whole you know my whole career and the the, the direction the apiary took where we had the, the tracheal mite came here first before the you know some years before the varroa came and so of course that was that seemed at the time like the end of the world you know that was the biggest problem you know before that the, the biggest real you know limiting factor or health problem for bees here was American fowl brood, which, you know, which had always always been here and, and it was, you know, pretty well under control, but that was the thing that could, you know, destroy colonies and equipment if you weren't careful. Um, but then this, this tracheomite came and all of a sudden, you know, bees that looked perfect in the fall just couldn't live through the winter and, you know, we'd, there'd be 30, 40, 50, or even more percent of colonies could could perish over the winter, you know, which was really a shock after, you know, being used, we used to consider a 5% winter loss to be normal um, here. So, you know, that was a huge shock. And like I say, seemed like the end of the world. And, you know, we all tried at first, you know, treating the bees with this menthol crystals. I think we all tried that at least once. And it was difficult to apply and, you know, it had the temperatures had to be just right. It was very easy to hurt the bees with it if it got too hot, and it wasn't very effective if it was too cold, and it just was very problematic. And so almost all of us just gave up on that after our first try, first or second try, and um, just started, you know, propagating the colonies that were surviving. And the other thing was, the serendipitous thing right at that time was I was already starting to work on this system that I've used ever since of overwintering nucleus colonies, of uh, starting small colonies in the midsummer and raising the new queens for them, and um, uh, then overwintering those queens and those small colonies on just four or eight combs over their first winter. And um, this whole thing I, I just discovered by accident, you, you know, you can find it in the old books. Um, you know, Jay Smith and others had systems of overwintering small colonies that they used very successfully in the northern states. Um, but it had kind of been forgotten and fallen out of use when it was so easy to get queens and packages from the south. And and frankly, when they those queens and packages did quite well here, um, before the tracheal mites came, it, it it was really amazing how well those bees that were selected and raised in the South did <laughs> here in New England. But once the tracheal mites came, that was the end of that. Um, and uh, so I was already, you know, I had already ramped up that system um, enough, so I was producing quite a few nucleus colonies over the winter, and so when these big losses from the tracheomites came, I, I did have bees of my own to, to replace them with. I didn't have to uh, uh, to, repl- to uh, get bees from the south or queens. I could use my own um, my own stock. So so anyway, that just naturally led to a system where I was 
rapidly propagating new colonies from uh, survivors of the tracheomite assault there. And it, it didn't take too long, just about three seasons, when the apiary had regained its uh, its strength again. And and um, uh, and frankly, the, the truth was I had, at the end of that time, I had bees that were even better than the bees I started with. And again, this, this gave me a, a key, you know, clue and insight um, into, uh, you know, how the, our so-called pests and diseases can, can really be used as our friends and allies. You know, it was really the, the tracheomites that had selected the colonies in that way and had pointed out which ones were really the best and um, enabled me to very easily, you know, propagate bees that were even better than what I started with before. And, you know, I should say that I, you know, I, I was already exposed to this idea, you know, the one of the basic tenets of organic farming that, you know, the, there's a real purpose for pests and diseases there. They really exist to, to point out where our practices are, are poorly adapted or unbalanced somehow, and that, you know, we shouldn't always just see them as enemies to be destroyed, but, you know, we should always try to learn from them and, uh, use them to, to help us improve our practice. So, you know, I realized that's what had happened um, in this tracheomite situation. And then, you know, that's what, you know, that whole situation gave me the confidence to want to try that again when the Varroa came, you know, some years later. You know, if the Varroa had come here first, I'm not sure, you know, I would have had the wherewithal to to approach things in that way. Um, but it was the experience I had with the tracheomites that, you know, gave me the courage and confidence to, to try and adapt the, the same method to the, um, you know, dealing with the varroa mites as well. Well, that's a talking about using the diseases as a, as a selection tool, as, as, as a beneficial aspect. That's something that, that I learned from you and that is not a, it's not commonly accepted in the beekeeping world or, or, or much of the agricultural world at all. But in the treatment-free beekeeping movement, um, it's definitely catching on, and it's something that we and um, people that I'm close to and, and people who are familiar with your work is something that they definitely um, are propagating. I just talked to uh, Troy Hall the other day. He'll his podcast will come out just before this one. Um, and he was talking about how you do things as well and how much he's learned from you. Yeah. Troy has been, you know, one of my, <laughs> my best, uh, students, if you call them. I, you know, I have, I'm very proud to have four people who have come here, you know, to learn about what I'm doing and who've adapted my methods very well to their own, you know, locations and, you know, are, are keeping bees without treatments or, you know, or with very minimal treatments, um, you know, being very productive and, and, uh, you know, profitable and have been able to build up a real way of life for themselves that way. And Troy, you know, Troy is one of them. Well, let's talk about, let's talk about some of those methods. The, um, the raising the nukes and overwintering the nukes is something that I've been very interested in. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that it, works the same way here as it works there. It definitely didn't work for me in Arkansas. It was, I think most of it had to do with um, the way the seasons, because you have a shorter, much shorter summer with a much higher flow, whereas in Arkansas we had a much longer warm season with a huge dearth in the middle. And so it I had to make nukes in the spring or had to do all my splitting and queen rearing and everything as early as I could in the spring so that they could be ready for the middle of the summer. And then by the time I got to fall, all the hives were usually bigger than nuke size. So it didn't really make sense to try and pull them back to nuke size when I could just overwinter them as full size hives. But for you, can you just give us a, as in depth as you want, kind of explain your how you do your nukes and and um, 
and what they provide, the benefits, um, possible uh, considerations as far as applying them to different areas, just anything you have. Yeah, well, well, first of all, the, the thing to say is, you know, uh, since, you know, having a, an apiary that hasn't been treated for, you know, since 2002, um, you know, there's a few things becoming, you know, clear. <laughs> um, and also from, you know, of course, there aren't very many of us who are running a commercial apiary that way. So, you know, the, the few of us, we love to, to talk together, you know, and share our um, trials and tribulations and our successes. Um, and the the thing that's really interesting and has become really clear is that each, you know, each one of us had to work out the, the system, you know, a combination of management and, and breeding things that worked in, in their area, you know, in their circumstances. And it's always at least a little bit different, and sometimes it's quite different. Um, there there was a meeting, you, you, you've probably had, Dean and Ramona on your show, or not yet, um, but I am familiar with their work. Yeah, in in uh, Massachusetts, and they had a um, they ran for some years. I don't know, three or four years, a little meeting in the summertime uh, devoted entirely to treatment-free beekeeping, and it was those were some of the best beekeeping meetings I ever went to. It, it just they had a wonderful um, feeling about them. There were people there were some people there from you know all over the U.S. and other parts of the world, too. And um, it it just was totally fascinating hearing people describe their experience from many different places and the, the variety of different schemes that people had come up with um, to adapt, you know, some a treatment-free beekeeping to their area. And, you know, that's what the, the takeaway message now really is. You can, you know, use somebody's... Um, uh, someone else's model to get started that that's good but you really need to just be watching all the time and find out how to adapt it the best to your your location um so anyway with that you know with that said my you know the the scheme that enabled me to you know to get rid of the treatments and make the the apiary productive without them was really very simple and straightforward i never i wouldn't claim it was easy because you know Losing or worrying about risking, you know, so much of your apiary at the beginning is really, you know, it's really stressful and trying. But, um, you know, with the experience I had with the tracheomites, the encouraging things that I heard from, you know, at that time, there was very few people with much experience um, without treating the bees. But there were, you know, glimmers of hope uh, um, here and there and, and indications that, you know, this this varroa mite was not as completely overwhelming to beekeeping as it was made out to be. Um, but the, the really simple and straightforward thing that worked was, was to combine just the simple method of, of making uh, new colonies in the midsummer with, with a, actually the absolute minimum number of bees to start them off. So the process of making my nucleus colonies is really almost identical to what a, a queen producer would use to set up their mating nukes in the beginning to set up each nucleus colony with the, the smallest number of bees that will you know make a healthy colony and then instead of catching the queens out of them you just gradually you know let them grow slowly for the rest of the season till they're just covering either four or eight combs in, in my case here and again like you said, I have a, we have a pretty short season here. Um, I start the nucleus colonies over a four-week period that starts in early June and is you know is over. Oh, it sometimes extends uh, into the second week of July. But that little window there has turned out to be the best, um, give the best results here. And you know, I I spent a very you know quite a lot a lot of time and money and. Um, He's experimenting with all, just trying, starting them at all different dates and, you know, different years and watching them, watching them progress. But that's what turned out to be the optimum time here for making these nukes is sometime in late, late June or very or early July. And again, that, you know, it always varies some, somewhat with the season. 
so I make mine up over a period of four or five weeks and uh you know start in in uh june and uh and finish in uh you know by the middle of july they're so the people who tried to copy my method at first they often made the mistake of starting the nukes later like in august where there is still enough time if conditions are good for a nuke a small nuke like that made up in you know in early august even to uh to grow if there's a good you know good fall flow to grow and fill the four frame space but those colonies started late just had a very poor record of overwintering success and and that's that was my experience too there seems to be something about um the new colony just being a unit all together once the once the original bees are gone and all the bees have come from the new queen you know so they're all functioning at their optimum together they're just it, it seems to be important for that process to go on before the you know to, to go run its course completely before the cold weather comes and the bees start to cluster so uh, again that's what we sort of found out by trial and error but um but that's really the the basis of it you know my my um I use for most of these nukes just standard hive bodies that are divided in half with a special feeder. Um, you can see pictures of all this on the on the website there. There's a photo gallery, and um, so it makes a. And I have a special bottom board that just makes a a, a nuke box with two uh, holding two completely separate colonies, and so there's room for four frames on either side. And I just start each one with a, a good frame of brood. You know, mostly sealed brood right next to the uh, next to the feeder. I'm sorry, a good frame of honey first with with the just with the bees on it. Um, just with whatever bees are working on that frame next to the feeder, and then a good frame of brood in the the second position, and then the third comb is where I use up all combs of pollen or combs of eggs, young larvae. Um, and that's just what I call the third comb, and then the fourth comb is, is always a frame of foundation, um, unless I have equipment I really need to, to use up or to get bees onto. But by the time I am making these summer nukes, I usually have just, just foundation left. So so that's how they're started here, and you know we, we normally have good enough conditions here that I don't need to feed these until you know the decision to how much to, how much they need for the winter time um, and i I usually do any fall feeding that's necessary. I try to do it the last week of September or the first week of October. That's kind of the optimum time here so um so anyway, the seasons differ you know we we had a we had a we've had a series you know twenty fourteen twenty fifteen have been the two best seasons here since oh six um, we've really had a long run of, of mediocre or very poor <laughs> seasons here with a lot of difficult weather. Um, and in, in a lot of those difficult years, all the nukes I made up on four combs, they never grew out of four combs. You know, even if they were made up in, in early June, they stayed on four combs the entire time. And then, but then the season, like the last two years, the, the nukes I make up in the first half of June, um, uh, or even later, sometimes I have to give them an extra four combs for the winter, and and sometimes even more than that. They do sometimes grow into into two story colonies. Again, it's the system is flexible, so you know I can um, I can have good success no matter what the season is like, or at least <laughs> reasonable success. 2011, 2013 were definitely the the most difficult years of my career for producing honey and bees, but but even those years too, I produced extra bees and you know had some for sale in the spring. So, and that's so anyway, a, but that's an important thing yeah. to talk about. Uh, I was just reading your latest article because I just noticed it had gone up there. I've read the whole website, and I recommend that any of anybody who's even kind of interested in treatment-free beekeeping should go to kirkwebster.com and read the whole thing. Uh, it's not nearly as expansive as, say, Michael Bush's website, 
and it's in a different sort of format, but it's excellent information. We'll give you all sorts of um, conceptual information and philosophical information as well as practical and how to do specific things. So I was reading that article, the most recent one, and you were talking about um, 2011 and 2013 um, can you just kind of tell us that story, what all happened in those years? Well, they were just very difficult weather years. Um, uh, the uh, Both both years we had a very excessive rain in the, the first half of the season. Um, that often sets us up for a difficult time when uh, we, we sort of, a lot of our summer resources for the bees depend on the uh, clover, uh, all different kinds of clover, which which bloom here, they you know it can it can bloom on hay fields and, and pastures, um, but it, it really depends on <laughs> the normal progression of, of warmer temperatures in June and the soil drying out. That's what gives the clover an advantage over the grasses that grow together with them. And when we have really excessive rain and cold temperatures that last through May and June, it gives the grass a huge advantage over the clovers. And they, you know, can can basically choke them out. So, you know, we have we have very little clover blooming later on, no matter what the the weather's like. So, you know, that was that was the way both of those years um, those years went. They were also it it stayed cool for most of the summer, and just those you know those were the two the only two years in my whole career here when I really thought that it was possible that you know our entire our honey crop would would fail completely and uh, it didn't quite happen both those years you know, I had just a very small crop of I, I don't know even just six or eight you know drums of honey where in a normal year I have you know somewhere between 25 and 50 um, so you know it was <laughs> it was pretty sparse but um, you know the, the the good thing was I was uh, again I, I like keeping the apiary balance between producing honey and, and producing bees for sale. And so I always had some bees for sale and, and uh, selling some queens in the summertime. And, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm just very conservative as a farmer. You know, when I have a half-decent year, I try to defer some of the payment till the next year to, to give me, um, you know, just in case of having a bad season. So between all those things, it you know, it wasn't too hard uh you know, to keep the apiary going, but, um, yeah, and it also helped a lot. Dean, Dean and Ramona started buying the honey. They wanted to market it as a special product and, you know, paid a higher price for the bulk honey than, than they could have gotten elsewhere. That was definitely a big, you know, uh, a, a big plus for me too. That helped a lot, but, um, yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's pretty much the story in a nutshell there of those, those two years. But I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the 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 takeaway from from that and and from throughout history of of your beekeeping, um, the resiliency of your method is one of the great features, don't you think? Yeah, definitely, and that's that's something I've you know I've really tried to pay attention to. Um, and again, the other like okay, so I've described. Um, you know, half of the story here with the, the production of nucleus colonies in the midsummer. Um, but the other half is was having access to the Russian bees, um, to having some stock that already had a history of coexisting with Varroa. Um, and, it, you know, it, the, the results were not perfect, but the Russian bees definitely, of all the bees I, I tested and tried in my system, were far superior to any other, just in their their general fitness and their their resiliency. You know, they have a lot of um, cons, you know, conservative and resilient sort of related traits um, that have enabled them to survive in a you know, similar cold environment. And also, where you know, varroa mites may have been present for up to a hundred years, where they they came from in that part of northeastern Russia. So. That was, you know, I'm not sure I could have done this without them. Uh, you know, I when I first started off around around 2000, when the Russian bees first became available to, you know, to beekeepers, um, uh, I 
also tried to collect any other bees that had, you know, were supposed to have some promise or some ability to coexist with the mites. I, I tried the, ori- the original, I, mean, I think what they call VSH now, they called SMR at the beginning, suppressed mite reproduction mm-hmm. um, from the, the lab in Baton Rouge. Uh, I also got some survivor queens that other beekeepers sent me, you know, just from bee yards that had, you know, been abandoned and all the colonies had died except one or two that seemed to be thriving and a few beekeepers sent me some queens like that, which I had, you know, no idea at all what what their ancestry was. Uh, And then I tried to, with my initial experiments just with my own bees that I had here, uh, of leaving them untreated and, you know, finding a few survivors. So I really had the, you know, these four sources of, you know, potential stock, the Russian bees, the the survivors from other beekeepers, um, the SMR bees, and um, the survivors of my own bees here. And there was just, there was just no, when I started, like, like I just described in that latest article on the, on the website, um, you know, when I would raise a hundred daughters from each each one, you know, breeder queens from each group. There was it was just clear as day. You know, the Russian bees were so much stronger uh, than any of the others. So the SMR bees had some extremely good colonies at the beginning, um, and and quite a good percentage of them just in the first year. But just with back crossing them to other survivors and my you know my little controlled mating. Um, team, they lost, you know, they were not able to hang on to their, you know, good qualities. It became harder and harder to find um, SMR queens that were good, you know, good enough for breeder queens, whereas the, and the other the other two, the, the, the survivors I got from other beekeepers, I did maintain some of them in the long run, um, but they were still nowhere near, you know, they had nowhere near the percentage of survival the Russians did. I Frankly, I would have I would have left them aside too, except that I you know I was just worried about the you know the diversity of my gene pool getting to be too small, and I knew these other bees were completely unrelated to the Russian bees, so I I kept them. And you know, I theoretically still have the families there, but all the bees that survived here and you know and came now all gradually just took on the Russian characteristics. They all they, they all started to resemble each other, no matter which family they started with. But that SMR family, you know, just really died out um, here. It didn't have the, whatever it is, the genetic depth or whatever to progress further, you know, in a, in a simple system like mine, um, whereas the Russian bees were very well adapted to that and, you know, quickly provided lots of good breeder queens and was able to, you know, split the different families and make new ones and where the other ones were lagging or, you know, or falling apart. So that was the other key thing. And that's what I emphasize with, you know, with everyone that you have to use management things and breeding together. You know, neither one of them is, is really adequate on its own. Um, yeah, that's what I, you know, thing I, I always emphasize. What characteristics do you look for in a hive that you want to become a mother? Well, the, the normal progression, um, you know, the way that, that I, I run the queens, the new queens through my system, um, you know, I have my breeder queens that I selected the year before, um, and, you know, and then that spring, and I'll, I'll get back to them. Uh, but anyway, the, the queens that I raise in the in the midsummer, I I made about two thirds of them up in the my isolated mating area. I I have an area in the Green Mountains here um, where it's very difficult for bees to survive year round, and you know from one year to another. And um, that's part of the reason I I located the apiary in this area where we have good honey producing locations that are favorable for bees. You know, a northern type climate, but with with good summers for bees. Uh, but where there were also um, potential isolated sites nearby, you know, in a practical, a reasonable distance. And we have here the the 
Champlain Valley. It's like the, the, an old lake bed. It's it's really looks like a little piece of Wisconsin actually that that got broken off and wedged in between Lake Champlain and the Green Mountains. And then the, the the Green Mountains here just sort of rise up like a wall, you know, in a in a straight line right along the edge of the valley. So it's very easy and close by. You know, I I live here to the equal distance for me to drive to most of my honey producing bee yards and to the uh, the isolated mating site. But it's, it's just you know just up in the mountains there. So that that's the other thing that that made this a good location. Um, to, to do what I'm trying to do, but um, yeah. So that's let's see. Uh, where was I? Where was I going with that? What, what was your your last question? I don't know. I'm <laughs> just uh, however you connect that to what you look for in a breeder queen. Oh yeah, the breeder. So so the breeder queens. You know the new queens. Um, I I do make some down here in the valley where I have, you know, quite a few bees around there, but there it's crowded with other beekeepers too. And excuse me, each one each one of them has a diff following a different plan. Um, but there are bees here, the the Mraz family apiaries and a couple of others that have continued to just select their own stock. Um, that have a, a simple method of reproducing new colonies by just splitting strong colonies in the spring and letting them raise their own queens. And that's how they've, they've done that for many decades is something that Charlie started. And that has resulted in a, a you know, a really a, a kind of a local strain of, of bee here that was quite well adapted here that, you know, and that's what, I was more or less working with before the Varroa came, but they unfortunately didn't have, you know, very much resistance to the Varroa mites, and that's why I decided it was worth it to to move on, you know, to move on to the to the Russian bees. But um, but otherwise, they are quite well adapted here, and it it's it's just it's worked out pretty well to make two thirds of my queens up in the mountains there, and, and one third down here in the valley, just with you know with all the bees around. And that way, it's just it's just a little bit safer for me. The the mountain location, the weather can get pretty sketchy. I, you know, it'd be, be possible up there to have a big, you know, failure of a mating. You know, one or two whole rounds of queens in the years when the weather's especially bad. So this way, I'm always getting at least some good matings. Again, it's just to try to build resilience into the whole thing. Um, you know, try not to try and get the optimum production each year, but to get the best average production, you know, with the least amount of trouble and expense uh, has, you know, has really always been my goal. Uh, and so anyway, the, you know, the, the two thirds of the Queens get made it up in the mountains. I used to clip all the Queens that, that were made it up there. So, you know, we knew exactly how old they were and, I keep track of the families that they were from and then bring them down. We catch them just, uh, you know, just like catching queens for sale. We catch them up there and bring them down here and start off my nucleus colonies in the midsummer with, with those queens. And then those that overwinter well, with all the nukes that overwinter, I keep the best ones to move them into honey production the following year. Then all the middle ones are the potential ones that get sold to other beekeepers, to my customers. And then the poorest ones, ones that aren't good enough to sell, those are the ones that build up slowly and then provide the brood for the next batch of nucleus colonies um, that we'd make up during the summer. So, but anyway, then following the queens again and, you know, the, the first summer, it's really just a half a summer of the, the queen's life is spent in a nucleus colony. They overwinter in a nucleus colony. They have to prove themselves, you know, with their own bees that they're, you know, to live in that situation and this kind of a climate, they have to be, you know, pretty tough. They have to be pretty long life um, and they have to be pretty frugal with their stores. So it's, it's quite easy to rank them in the spring in these four or eight frame boxes, you know, based on the cluster size, how much honey they have left. Um, and again, I, I really feel like I, I, I've set things up. So it's the, in, 
environment here that's really doing the selecting, you know, much more than I am. You know, I'm, I'm doing the easy part. You know, I just find the ones that look the best to the beekeeper with, you know, as he does his everyday work. Um, but then, you know, you, you can, you can um, evaluate the colonies and the small nukes for their characteristics too, like their temper and um, their response to a honey flow, you know, how, how, how eager they are to gather nectar and things like that. But it's, it's really, you know, this, the environment here, the cold winter, the constant presence of varroa mites um, that, are, that are guiding things uh, more than anything else. And then, so the second year, the queen will spend in honey production, will move the best nukes into the honey-producing bee yards, or sometimes I'll move the queens or introduce them into overwintered two-story colonies. Um, and then they spend the, their second year or, their, or the first full year in the honey production colony. And that's, that's pretty much the acid test for uh, you know, varroa resistance uh, for the colony, for queen to head a colony through a whole season you know, with a big brood nest the entire time of continuous brood rearing during the, the warm weather, or at least continuous while the um, while conditions are good. These, the Russian bees are, are pretty sensitive to conditions, and sometimes so they slow down their egg laying um, during a, a dearth period or whatever. But but anyway, that that's that's really the acid test of honey production. And then if if those you know colonies that produced a good crop of honey overwinter and have a really good looking cluster of bees in the spring with nothing wrong with them, you know, there you, you, you've really got something, you know, worth propagating. Well, that, uh, that rule of thirds you were talking about where you, where you kind of split them up into thirds and sell the middle and keep the top and then, um, use the bottom for brood. That is something I definitely got from you and something I've been using for several years. And, um, the way I do it is, and this, this links into one of the other things too. I don't know if I got this from you or maybe Michael Palmer and that's not splitting, um, the really good productive hives. Cause a lot of times, especially with, with hobbyists, they want to, they take, they want to take their best hive and they want to split it. But then you kind of lose a lot of your honey production there and you kind of fluster the, the really good production, you kind of mess it up by splitting it. Whereas <clears throat> using a method like grafting, you can take your best hive and get the genetics out of it, but not mess their production up for the year. So I just wanted to point out that that, that rule of thirds is really useful. And, and what I did was, um, like you, keep the, the top third for myself, sell the middle third. And then I don't know if you do sort of the same thing, but the bottom third, I would, um, in the spring when I'm, I use, um, uh, queen castles for mating nukes. And so I would take, I would just take all the brood from one of those hives, you know, say a, a hive only has six or eight frames of brood. I would take all but one frame of brood and leave them with the the field force and then that one frame of brood and then they would have their chance to build up again before winter. And if they didn't survive that, I wouldn't really consider that a big loss because they weren't doing that great to begin with. And then I would have all this brood to make my mating nukes with. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That that's, that's quite close to what I, you know, what I do. Um, I, I use, you know, now I have, I don't, um, I don't take any brood at all from my honey producing yards uh, right. for, for making nukes. Now it's just, I mean, I, I could, but it's just efficiency wise. And I've, you know, I've got the whole system ramped up to the point where, um, I just have yards entirely devoted to honey production and then other yards entirely devoted to new production. Um, and so the, uh, the colonies that are left after, you know, after moving the best ones to honey production, the nucleus colonies that are left after moving the best ones to honey production, and then um, selling selling some, and and then the the poor ones that are left, I assemble them all in a couple of two or three locations, and in, in just one corner of these big 
Duke Yards, and I just let them slowly build up um, until, you know, ideally they're they're just barely covering 20 columns, you know, which is much later than, you know, any of the other, the other colonies are already working in honey supers or whatever, but those those weaker colonies, it provides brood at just the right time, you know, for making my next crop of nucleus colonies, and I, I use up most mostly the entire colonies. You know, I do sometimes, like, like you say, I'll just I'll leave them with the queen and even just a frame of eggs and, you know, empty combs. There's some combs of honey and all the field bees. And, you know, they do, in fact, if the seasons have decent, you know, reestablish themselves. And, and it, and, you know, usually without any mite problems at all, because you've taken most of the mites out with the brood. Um, and so, but I, but I consume most of them. I, you know, a lot of those queens are, are, you know, substandard compared to my others. I, I do, you know, weed most of those out. If there's a especially good-looking one, we'll catch her and put her in a cage and, and keep her, you know, if we have an opportunity, need a place to put another queen, but they really aren't, you know, considered part of the program anymore. Um, yeah, and that's how I manage mine, but there's, you know, all different ways to do it. It makes sense to me what, you know, Michael has described of even, you know, taking apart his, his colonies in the honey-producing yards that aren't producing anything. You know, and using all that resource for nukes. Well, I guess a lot of that would depend on on your mobility. Like you were talking about moving hives around to different yards. How much do you do that? Well, I again, that that's the reason I don't do take brood from the honey producing yards. Um, to, just because I already have, and I try to do the minimum amount of of moving, but. It's really in the in the spring and the early summer getting everything in the in position for, you know, getting the bees to the honey producing yards, getting the nukes to where the customers can pick them up, and then consolidating the the, the poor nukes that are bees that'll be brood you know brood source or brood mothers for the next crop of nukes. That a lot of the moving that I do is revolved around that, and then when I make the nukes up in the nuke yards, we do you know, make them up and then move them to a different yard. Um, it just makes a little bit better. Um, so the, the, yeah, so they don't recognize where they are when they start off. How many total colonies do you like to keep in a gen, in a normal year? Well, I try to produce honey with about 300 and now I'm, I'm trying to work with 10 honey producing locations with 30 in each each location, um, and then I have another four locations just for producing nucleus colonies. And again, I, I move them back and forth in those four locations. I but I usually I would, it, it depends on the year what what's going on, but um, you know there's usually between one and two hundred nucleus colonies there at the end of the season in any of those um, those locations. If someone wants to buy a nucleus colony from you, about what time of year should they get their order in before everything is uh, spoken for? Well, they need to, you know, like right now, I already have a list for 2017 going. You know, I nice. uh, my production is not huge. You know, I, I've my goal is always to sell, you know, 200 boxes of bees. You know, I sell the the boxes with the bees. Um, and some of those boxes have an eight-frame colony in them, and some of them have two four-frame colonies in them. I've been, yeah, I, for some years I did just eight-frame nucleus colonies, but those the pairs were always very popular. It's a really good, it's a great buy for people. It's a really great product. And I had some trouble at first controlling the brush and bees in that small space in the spring, but now I'm starting to, to sell those again. But... But anyway, I, I, I didn't reach my, that goal, you know, for during the, the real poor years there. Um, and I'm, I, still, I didn't quite get there last year almost, but I'm creeping back up to it again. Um, but that's, I've, I've kept that, you know, that production goal for a long time really hasn't changed the, the size of the apiary. And I have been also selling, you know, you know, around 300 queen bees each summer also. I'm I'm taking a couple seasons off from that to rebuild, to get some new combs drawn out for foundation on the baby combs. 
um, and to free up a little more time here at the farm. Now, I, you know, I, I live in a place now where I have a, I have a little farm to take care of in addition to the apiary. So, um, yeah, I just I need a little more time for that. But I'm I'm hoping to go back to selling queens again in uh, uh, 2018. So do you but build? It's, it's, go ahead. Production is small. Yeah, it's just you know the production is pretty small on the grand scale of things. You know, I've, <laughs> my my big project now. I'm starting to have um, some people working with me full time here who are really interested in starting their own apiaries and. Um, want to learn this method from the beginning and so i i have my first real sort of full-time apprentice types moving in here very shortly so that's my big excitement at the moment and that's where i'm you know trying to put you know whatever extra energy i have now do you build those boxes yourself or how do, how do you do that yeah i do i, I buy um some pine lumber here every spring and just sticker it up and dry it over the summer and then plane it and, and build it from scratch. I buy the frames, you know, knocked down, uh, you know, already cut out and assemble them, but I build everything else. And I make the foundation too. That, that was, you know, one of my big, <laughs> my huge projects that actually cost me much more grief than the Verona might ever did. I think <laughs> it, was, it was really hard. Um, setting up a system now that you know now that i have it all working it seems pretty simple but you know, i just i got a lot of bogus information and the the first mills that i had made a foundation that the bees didn't recognize very well and you know would often make their own pattern on top of it so but i've you know i've overcome those things now and even though i don't i don't think this this issue of the foundation being contaminated has turned out to be as, you know, as big an issue as I was afraid it would be. And that's, you know, really good news. And, you know, there's more beekeepers now using, um, using formic acid and thymol to control the mites. And I, I have, you know, several beekeepers I watch and, and, uh, you know, help out here and there and just watching their colonies grow with the foundation from the, factories you know from the companies and i just i really can't see that they're it's really holding them back in any way so i'm glad that hasn't turned out to be you know as big a deal as i thought but i did go to all the trouble and learn to make my own foundation you know with a simple system that i could make a couple thousand sheets every year i don't you know i don't want to sell it or anything but you know we do have a pretty long winter here so i have time you know to do that it takes about a week now to make you know, from setting up to cleaning everything up to make my my two thousand sheets or whatever. That's yeah. the The foundation contamination thing is something that I have talked about for a number of years, and it just people would say, "Well, why do you buy foundation when the wax is all contaminated and all this stuff?" And I'm I'm saying, well, number one. Foundation is made usually from capping's wax, which of all the wax in the hive is going to have the least amount of contamination. It's the freshest, it's the whitest, it's the newest. Um, And then the bees don't really do much with the foundation itself. They just build off of it. So um, the the nature of the chemicals being uh, lipophilic and how they, they stay in the wax, I just don't see the foundation causing that much of a problem. And, and as I, as I've told them, I've been using the same foundation for 13 years now, and I can't see that I've had any sort of setback because of it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, you know, that's been my, my observation too, though. You know, there were a couple of studies you know, that at the beginning, that's what, what worried me that, you know, they were showing that I mean, Increasing amounts of kumafos and the wax they use for the queen cell cups was definitely affecting the queen larvae. Mm-hmm. A couple that were done, and um, but you know kumafos is 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 pretty much gone. I think now I you know I'm uh, I'm sure amatras not all that red hot. You know a lot of people still still using that, but it just seems like more and more people going towards the acids and um, thymol products. And just, you know, it, it, it just hasn't seemed to be a huge issue, you know, like you, I, I, I feel the same way. 
Well, there's so many more questions I want to ask you, but I think we have to wrap it up for today. I uh, really want to thank you for uh, for consenting to talk to me today and uh, hope to have you on again at some point. Um, your Your information has been really foundational for my beekeeping, and I have certainly passed it on with attribution, of course, to people that I talk to. Um, especially certain certain specific methods, and um, uh, I, again, I, re- I really just thank you for for having this conversation with me. Yeah, well, you're very welcome, and you know, I'd be glad to do it again if we just you know can plan a little bit ahead, and you know, maybe keep it out of that real busy window from <laughs> the middle of April till the Fourth of July. Um, yeah, I'd be I'd be glad to do it again if if it's helpful to people out there. That's you know that's fine with me. Absolutely. Me and that was Kirk Webster. Hope to have him back on in the very near future. Maybe uh, this fall would be an excellent time when he gets done with his beekeeping schedule. All right, now time to wrap up the show. Again, I want to thank everybody who supports the podcast via Patreon.com. That's Patreon.com slash TFB, I think it is. Um, If you want to hear more, find out more, not hear more, read more about Kirk Webster and uh, his articles that he's written, you can find those at KirkWebster.com. Those are really good articles. I periodically go back and read them, look at the pictures. He There are pictures in there of how he does his nukes that we talked about today, either the uh, the side-by-side four-frame, double four-frame nukes, or side-by-side double eight-frame nukes, which are housed in two boxes, one over the other, with a um, division board feeder in between to keep to keep the two nukes from mixing. Do check those out. Maybe build some for yourself. I'm thinking about it. And uh, you can check out our forum, which can be found at forum.tfbs.net. You can find my new website, which hopefully by the time this has been published, will be published. My website will be new web, website will be published. I had to move away from the Parker Farms name because I just moved to Oregon and Parker Farms is taken here. So I'm going to be switching to Parker Bees and that website will be parkerbees.com. It'll be the same website. You can find the same information all about beekeeping, uh, sort of a small encyclopedic compilation of beekeeping information. Um, Uh, Of course, every day there are great discussions going on at the Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash treatment-free beekeepers, or you can just search for treatment-free beekeepers and find it there. I guess that's about it. So have fun keeping bees, because if you're not having fun, you probably shouldn't be doing it. (laughs) 